Uh, four or four, just uh, let me stand by a minute. Just come on, uh, uh, what is your attack on? Okay, now? talk to him, see what that did. Charlie Hurst, 88. Uh, 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 okay, I'll put it a little closer than those trees. Let me come around with a Lao 3 and I'll put it on those trees there. Uh, Roger that, Lao 3. And if you could tell me your name and the plane that you flew. Okay, Michael John Steger. The, all the planes I flew? Yeah, let's have the background of all the planes you flew. Okay, Just well, I started off in a training command flying the T-6. And, and then uh, when I finally got my wings, I was assigned to a squadron in Germany flying F-84s. I also got to ride, got to fly the F-86 a little bit just before I left because we transitioned to 86s from 84s. I came back to the training command and there I flew the T-28 for a little bit and then mostly the T-33. Uh, at that point, that was, let's see, how long ago was that? In the, in the 60s sometime. Uh, or early 60s, I uh, decided to, I better watch it and be careful about flying. Uh, so I got a, I went to graduate school, got a degree in mathematics, <laughs> and I taught at the Air Force Academy for five years, mostly calculus. While I was there, that was down in the middle 60s, um, I started to hear about the Vietnam War, and I thought, gee, that's something I ought to do. I really should do that. So I volunteered to go over as an advisor. At that time, they had T-28s, and that's what I thought I was going to be flying. However, they switched to A-1s, and so I went through training in the A-1 at Corpus Christi, and then went over as an advisor to the Viet for the Vietnamese. Which uh, model A-1 were you flying? Uh, both the A-1E and A-1. Uh, the two-place chubby. The, the fat face. Yeah, the fat one. <laughs> uh, when I got there, I, the uh, squadron was just a, just a detachment. It wasn't a squadron yet, and down at uh, Natrang. And I was down there. One day I, I came to work, and they said, we now a new squadron. Well, they only had six pilots. I said, what the heck? How can you be a squadron with just six pilots? And uh, th so we started to build up the squadron strength by getting new pilots right out of flying school. We got 20. Uh, and you know, it was interesting because two of those guys were outstanding right away. And two should not, <laughs> should, in my opinion, should not even graduate from flying school. Uh, but the rest were in between. We had a bell-shaped curve, which is the same thing I experienced in the Air Force with people coming into squadrons. You have a bell-shaped curve. Some are really good, some are Crappy. <laughs> Bad. What was the squadron uh, number and detachment that, that was formed for them? 520. The 520. The 520th feet aft squadron, yeah. And the train. They had some very good pilots come out of there even later in the war, did they not? Yes. Uh, the, when I first got there, the, the experience, there were two guys that were really experienced, three of them were very experienced and uh, had a lot of combat time. One of them had like 3,000 hours of combat time. And when I, I met him and some of the others uh, at, uh, after the war down at uh, Pendleton, where they, were, where they got assigned, where they got into camp there, uh, he had 9,000 hours of combat time. 9,000 hours, unbelievable. Now an average pilot, a U.S. pilot would have roughly how many hours in the A-1? Well, I think I'm pretty average. I had 4,500 hours of, com of flying time, about 900 combat and about 400, 450 missions. Uh, but that was in one year. He, their philosophy was that they were going to be flying, they loved flying just like we did, until they got killed. One by one, those experienced guys were getting picked off. But it was a slow, slow process because they were so good. Was Pham Swan in your, I, th I think he was in the 520th, wasn't he Pham Swan? A little later on, he's a Vietnamese pilot. He pulled, I, I, he flew for like six years. Um, there, was a, there was a squadron uh, named Pham, 
Fam von Pham, that uh, was a real good friend of mine, and I still, still correspond with him, uh, that was in there, in that squadron. He was one of the experienced guys, and so was another guy named Locke, L-A-C, but he has passed away since then. Okay. Can you tell us what it was like training the South Vietnamese? Because that was your primary yeah. OS, was as an advisor. Was well, to yeah, one of the things that happened, when we got these 20 new guys, the, the squadron commander said, oh, you now IP, instructor pilot. And I had a tour as instructor pilot, uh, as I mentioned earlier, and uh, so I kind of worked up a little syllabus. Uh, it took about 45 hours of flying to get a guy checked out combat ready. Uh, we, first of all, they hadn't flown at all in the, in the A1E, which was a single engine thing. It's a little bit harder to fly, for one thing. It, in, the, in the A1E, in the, in the two place job, the fat, fat face thing, it has a rudder that sticks up quite a ways in the air, and you're out of the control, out of the prop wash, so it's a little easier to to land, and uh, to fly it. But the A1E, the thing is in the prop wash, and it's got, that torque is just really hard. So we had to first of all get them to fly the A1E. They never flown it before. Then we had to start taking them up on different kind of combat missions, uh, bobbing, uh, strafing, napalm, rockets. And we go through had to go through that they did each of at least each of those things, uh, at least once. I would demonstrate, and they would do it, and so on. Uh, and we had formation flying, instrument fl well, a little bit of instrument flying. They didn't like instrument flying, but I did it anyway. <laughs> Everybody should know a little instrument <laughs> training. Uh, I think some of the Kennedys would profit yeah. by that one, knowing a little bit about instrument yeah. flying. So uh. I like to every time we came back from a mission. I would like to do a GCA, uh, ground control intercept, uh, GCA, ground control approach, and that's a radar thing. That, or the, the the guy on the ground has radar. He knows where you are. He tells you turn left, turn right, do this, uh, uh, so on, and uh, it's to make an instrument landing. You can land in zero zero weather with that airplane, with that kind of instrument, and I thought it was always good to practice it. Uh, by the way, there was an island out there uh, right off the end of the runway, and you'd go past that island like this, and you'd see it up like this. And uh, I read a book one day uh, about, like, uh, well, it was about Vietnam, a guy, I think it called Up Country. I don't know if you ever heard of that book or not. But one of the places they stopped was at the Trag, and they went out there to the island for a doodle scholarly. <laughs> I th I'm glad I didn't know about it while I was there. I probably would have spun in so trying to see what was going on. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> you know, the, the more that I interview gentlemen like yourself, the more ironically funny stories that just slip out. You know, one guy was telling me about how they had a pet bear that they, you know, grew and they would wrestle with this bear and it was okay when it was a cub, but, you know, after a couple of months it got a little perilous and I was like, who wrestles with a bear? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, our squadron in Germany and, had a... Now you have a nudist colony off yeah. your runway. <laughs> they had a pet monkey that we had that he bought from the circus one time and it would run around the officer's club Crap on things. Tear the, it was awful, awful monkey. Tear so, the curtains. Did you have to pull any uh, search and rescue missions? In no, I was. I did not. I did not do any of that. I'm sorry. That would have been. I almost. I was thinking very seriously of volunteering to come back for another tour to do that, but I never got around to it. What year were you there? Sixty-five. Sixty-five, and that's when you were with the five twentieth, correct? Right. Okay. Now, um, any prairie fire missions at the time? Because I know the South Vietnamese, and I, I'm really thinking the 520th picked up when we started pulling back out in like 72. We had groups that were assigned just to prairie fire missions and SARS. So I, No, I don't remember those at all. Okay. We did we had almost all close air support. Uh, a, an outpost would get bombed or murdered the night before, and we'd go up and, and uh, put, and fly around and drop some bombs on the people if they could find them and, and uh, so on. I had one mission, a convoy had been 
um, ambushed on the road. And uh, we went up that morning to, to uh, protect it. And the forward air controller, we weren't allowed to drop anything unless the forward air controller told us where to drop. So he had us drop about oh, 100, 150 yards away from the road. I think he wanted to see how accurate we were because then he said, come in 20 yards closer. Come in 20, next time 20 yards closer. So pretty soon we were right. Finally he said, I want you to strafe the road, the ditch along the road. Well, that was only 10 yards from where the, air, where the APCs were parked and the trucks and so on. And I remember going down there and concentrating so hard on that ditch and that, so I, would, I didn't want to shoot the, the trucks at all. And when I pulled up, there was a tree in front of me. I've never drunk so hard on a stick in my life. <laughs> I don't know how I missed that tree. I have no idea. I could have sworn I was going to go right through it. So, um, how many years total flying do you have? And, and did you go anywhere past the A-1? Or was that the end of your career? No, I, I flew after that. Uh, but was only proficiency flying. Uh, I was in the Pentagon. We fly on weekends and so on like that to get some flying time in. The, uh, I flew for 22 years. And what then they said, we can't fly anymore. <laughs> uh, did you, uh, what did you retire at? What was your ranking? Do you guys was, want to take a break? Do you need to step out? Yeah, I, I think I'll take him back. We'll be out in just a few minutes. I'm sorry it's so warm here, big fella. You stay out there. There you go, it's much cooler out there. We'll be out in a little bit. Oh, I fine. understand. Yes, it's horrible. That's all right. Yeah, that too. No, we can add it. No big deal. So, um, I was a major when I went over to Vietnam, but when I when I came back from Vietnam in the Pentagon, I was promoted to lieutenant colonel and then made colonel a few years later. What did you do in the and, Pentagon? In the Pentagon? I was in a group called Studies and Analysis. <laughs> we studied things and we analyzed them. <laughs> Actually, we got involved with a large inter-theater transportation uh, project. And uh, it's quite a long story, but that was what we were involved. Okay. Now, um, do you have any other particular memories of, say, a funny moment with one of your uh, South Vietnamese students or anything? Because they rode with you while you were training, correct? Yes. Some, well, yes. It, they would fly in the two the fat uh, uh, place airplane, and then they would fly solo on, our, on our, my wing. And we'd do the same thing, we just, uh, you know, bombing, strafing, whatever. Uh, funny stories, I probably got a lot of them, but right offhand I can't remember. That's fine. <laughs> I can't think of one. That's fine. Is there anything else that you'd like to talk about? And, uh, you know, just tell us about your experience. Would you go back and do it all over again? Oh, yes. I, for two reasons. First of all, there's something about the A-1 that most pilots really fell in love with. Uh, I don't know what, the, what, it was like a mystic thing. Most of us had been flying jets for, 50, I flew for 15 years before I went to the A-1. No torque, beautiful visibility in front of you because you land on the, on the uh, tricycle landing gear. And then you go to the A-1 and it's completely different, a big torque machine. And you can't see in front of you, it's the, the engine blocks it out. Anyway, we all fell in love with it. It was perfect for the Vietnamese for close air support work. It had a tremendous amount of uh, ca capacity, 15 bomb racks. We had some missions that would be bombs, napalm, rockets, and then it had four 20 millimeter cannons, two on each wing, and we'd expend all that ammunition on things, like I did in that ditch. Uh, the, uh, see, that's what, it was just something about that airplane that was just uh, great. You should tell them about the, um, when you landed it in the water. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, you had a water landing? Yes. With an A-1? With an A-1. Man, you must have I may have been the everywhere. only person that ever ditched an A-1. Um, the story starts out like this. I was getting ready to fly one day, and my boss happened to come walk by and said, hey, I noticed, Mike, that you're not wearing a Mae West, the little other Mae West that we had when you go flying, and you're not setting a good example for the Vietnamese pilots. And I thought to myself, well, crap, we'll never fly over the water. 
Well, we do sometimes. We take off over the water, but we come right back to land. Anyway, two weeks later, I was taken off one day, and the engine quit. It didn't completely quit, but it was going chuck, 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 just barely. I had no, I lost lose the power right away. And I had four or five hundred pound bombs on board, so I was jettisoning them. There's a lever that you pull to jettison them, and uh, I could see that I wasn't going to make it to the runway anymore. In fact, I could see I wasn't even going to make it to the shore, and I ended up ditching it. And the Navy, I remember from the, uh, studying that, that there were 11 steps in the ditching procedures, and I got through five when, <laughs> when the engine hit, or when the airplane hit. Um, one of the things that happened that night, I was at the officers' club, and I was talking to some guys that ran an army fuel dump on the beach, consisting of 55,000 gallon bladders in a star-shaped thing. There were five of them, and motor in the They would offload the fuel from the ships, and then they would fill up with that the, the trucks and the tanks and so on. And I was heading right for them. They said they were bailing out of there because they thought I was going to come in and land right in the middle of that thing. And I probably would have if I hadn't gotten all the bombs off. Two of the bombs didn't fall off. Only out of four, two of them did. And they were the two that were on the stubs, so they stuck out quite a bit like this. In fact, I could have seen them if I looked out like that, uh, that they were still there. But that made the, nose, the airplane no heavy. When I got checked out by the Navy, they said this airplane will float forever. Don't worry about it. You can just float and float and float. Well, I was in the, it, it landed in the water, and then I noticed that I, the waves were like this. I had time to go, and I was underwater, still in the cockpit. And that was really something. I said, oh my God, I'm still in the cockpit. Well, then you have to unstrap, and your, your hands get wet, uh, and leather gloves are real slippery. I finally got out. I tried to unbuckle my uh, parachute. I couldn't unbuckle. It was too slippery. And I could see the surface up there a little ways. And I'm a good swimmer. I said, oh, no problem. And I said, I wasn't making any room at all, not moving at all. I said, oh, my God, I'm going to drown. Finally, I remembered that under our Bay Weston. <laughs> and I popped it right up to the top. And uh, by the way, I, one reason that I, saw, that I couldn't swim like that, I had combat boots on, an ammo belt full of ammo, a, a gun. Uh, two or four, three or four knives. I had a, all kinds of knives and uh, radios. I, I, I weighed the stuff one time and took my, weighed myself, and then took my uniform, took this all off and weighed them again. 14 pounds that weighed. That was enough to keep you from being able to swim anything. Not to mention the drag. I and mean, that's a lot. When you yeah. start trying to move through the water and yeah. with anything. The other thing is that. Uh, I don't remember that I went back and told my colonel, <laughs> thank you for telling me to, to, to wear the Bay West. <laughs> oh, I bet you wish you did, didn't you? Oh, boy. Yeah. yeah. Wow. You survived a water landing. That is, uh, I, I have not met anybody that went into the water. I don't, with I, I think I'm the only A1 that's ever did one, yeah. You are in some big company here. Yeah. That's definitely a mark you can set. Yeah. <laughs> There's a couple of guys that might try to sit, you know, jump in there right now and, and see if they could do the same thing, you know. There's some <laughs> crazy guys in that room. Yeah, yeah. All right, so anything else that uh, you're hiding there that you can bring out and tell me? Any kind of cool... Do you got any other ones that you know of? Because that... that's Well, there was another time you had to bail, bail out. out. The eject? You said that you had to eject twice. Did you... Yeah, that was from an F-84 in Germany. He when was I was flying over there, I was, uh, we were climbing up on some kind of a, a long-range practice exercise. And uh, at, we were going through pretty high up. Uh, well, anyway, my edges started making a loud grinding sound. And I could see it, was, it wasn't getting any power. So I broke out of the formation. I was number three guy. And number four followed me around because he told me afterwards, that, well, I heard guys say, Mike, you're on fire, bail out, eject, I mean, eject, you're on fire. Well, I pulled the levers right away, got out. He said it was 27,000 feet when I did that. It turns out, I think, I don't have a record, but it may have been a record for emergency ejection. There have been other people that have gone a lot higher, 
uh, for practice, I mean, for uh, scientific research. And, uh, but I don't think in emergency, that's probably about as high as you can go. It turns out that the airplane in the seat, you, it tumbles, the seat tumbles like this as you're going out. And um, I tried to stop the tumbling. Well, if you're, if you're free fall and you just put your body straight like this, you'll stop tumbling. But in the seat, you, you can't do that. And so finally I decided, heck with it, I kicked. You had to manually re take the seat belt off I mean, I, I release it and then kick the seat away and then pull the ripcord all manually. Nowadays it's all automatic. You don't have to do anything. You could go out and be completely unconscious and everything done automatic for you. Everything. Anyway, uh, the, the, uh, as a result, of, it turned out that I was at 25,000 feet when I uh, did all that. I found out a couple years later, going through some kind of training, that don't ever open your chute above 25,000 feet. <laughs> well, I went out at 27, and if I'd opened the chute right away, I might have died. Lack of oxygen, for How one thing. How long did it take you to descend from? And it takes quite a while. <laughs> I was very nonchalant. When I chute opened and I was hanging in a parachute, I looked at my watch to see what time it was. I couldn't remember it. I kept looking at it. I could not <laughs> focus and, and get that thing in my, fix in my mind. I have no idea. You were probably hypoxic. No, well, maybe, but I was also uh, full of adrenaline or something. Mm -hmm. And this, I saw this when I, when I was in the, sitting in the cockpit, or I mean in the parachute, I saw the airplane hit because there was a big ball of flames and I landed okay. Um, a German pulled aside, this was in Germany, the land pilot I came running up there in the car and uh, picked me up and took me back down to where the thing had, uh, where it was crashing. But when, when he did that, he, uh, I asked him if he had a knife. In German, it's haben Sie ein Messer. That's the only German I know. <laughs> and uh, he had a knife and I cut a jack knife and I cut a chunk of, of, the, of the parachute for a souvenir, for a scarf. And, uh, was the orange, I like the orange section. Uh, by the way, I used to wear that in, in Vietnam. I like to throw it out like Snoopy does. I kind of throw it out and, 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 while I'm taxiing around, and this thing was waving like this. And my boss said, Mike, that's not a good, you're not, you're not supposed to do that. <laughs> I did it anyway. Until one day I was coming back in, uh, turning into the parking place with the wings folded, and this, uh, this Loose scarf went like this and <laughs> right over my eyes, and I couldn't see what I was doing. And I, I decided not to do that anymore after that. <laughs> How long was your scarf? How long was that scarf? Well, it was, you, you know, about this long. I've seen. About six feet or so. <laughs> I've got some stock footage, and when, when we talk about this, I'm going to put this in there. But the guys used to throw this huge yeah. scarf. It was like six or eight feet yeah. long, and they hooked it to their D ring. Yeah. Um, the, the young guys, when they would get transitioned in, everybody's like, you're going to get your scarf, you're going to get your scarf. <laughs> and then they, they'd be going down through it, and nobody told them to hook it to the D-ring, so they'd have it around their neck, and they'd throw it out in that prop wash, just like, Ugh! And they, <laughs> it was a big joke. <laughs> so that was the rite of passage, but yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh my goodness. Well, they, uh, back to the ejection, mm -hmm. and I cut out a chunk of, of the scarf, and I walked over, I was, drove over to where the, there was a hole in the ground. Nothing, all I could see was just a hole, a little smoke filling up like this. And they had a, a rope around it, and they kept saying in German, munitions, something you missed, something you missed. I said, no, 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 we had no munitions, we didn't carry any munitions. Usually, we had 50 caliber machine guns, and most of the time we had, they weren't loaded at all. But sometimes they were loaded, and I, didn't know that we were in this phase where they had loaded them again. Because, well, I walked out, I looked at the hole and went, pow, <laughs> the counter cooked off. I backed out of there real fast. <laughs> wow. Mr. Lucky. We call yes, him Mr. Mr. Lucky. Lucky. <laughs> yeah. Well, is there anything else you'd like to tell me about, Mike? Well, I'll tell you, I, uh, I've told you how I felt about the A1. Well, I think most of us do. And the, the other thing is uh, the Vietnamese pilots were, in my experience, 
very, very good. Some of them were absolutely outstanding. There were a couple of guys, I would have bet on them against any Americans for a bombing run or anything else. They were so good. Of course, they had 3,000 hours of combat time <laughs> at that time and uh, had a lot of experience. Did you notice that their mindset was different than an American mindset because they, that was their homeland? Was, can you tell me anything about that? Just asking a question. Yeah, I'm sure there was. Uh, I don't know exactly how to, how to answer your question. Uh, I remember that uh, during Tet, they all wanted to go home for the Tet celebrations. And they lived in all different parts of the country. And we acted like with our fat face, uh, A1, we'd take a whole bunch of people up. I've had as many as 11 uh, pilots and, and, and uh, crew chiefs sent back there, sitting there, while we went, out, went someplace. Anyway, I flew up to Way one day, which is the very northern part of uh, Vietnam, and the runway was closed. They had been boarded. <laughs> they had an attack going on. And uh, I think, I, I remember that I had to wait till I got a green light from the tower before it to come in and land. And then we, the next day, we pick, or two days later, we picked them up. Uh, that reminds me of another story. <laughs> We had a, a, an A-1 one time that uh, crash landed in a mud flat kind of a thing. And um, they wanted to salvage the guns and, and equipment, some vital equipment, so the BC wouldn't get it. And while they were doing that, then we would go up there with our, and, and provide cover. We'd just fly around in a circle. And I was getting ready to fly. I, had a fat, I was assigned a fat face that day. And uh, so, I asked the crew chief uh, if any of these pilots want to fly with me. I mean, not pilots, any of the crew chief. So he had a young guy. He said, yeah, he'd like to fly. So he got in the car. I couldn't speak at all. I couldn't speak any Vietnamese, and he couldn't speak any English. Uh, anyway, we got up there, and we flew around and around and around. I let him fly. I told him what to do. I demonstrated for him, let him do it. And then uh, when we got through, we had to drop some bombs. Well, it was on a hillside, so we'd dive like this and then pull up like this. And about the third time we pulled up, I looked over and he was like this. <laughs> Hiding his head, his grin, and, and he didn't, then when we landed, I said, ask him if he wants to fly again sometimes. The guy said, no, no, no. <laughs> That's awesome. That is fantastic. <laughs> Oh my goodness. I tell you what, this is a treasure sitting down to speak with you. And it's rare to have somebody like yourself. I, you know, I've interviewed a lot of pilots, but you've shed a lot of light on what it's like uh, to, on the training side and, and what it was like to be with the uh, South Vietnamese. And I know there's going to be some pilots here this weekend. Have you heard that? I heard there's going to be some. I, would... I think six, I've heard. Oh, oh great. That's so wonderful. I'm excited to meet yeah. you with them. And... Uh, when we were at Fort Walton Beach, there was only one Vietnamese pilot. And I went up and talked to him, and he said, oh, I was in the five, he saw my thing, so well, I was in the 522nd, or 520th. And I looked at his name, and his name looked very familiar to me. And uh, I said, come on back to the hospitality room, I've got a, a whole bunch of pictures. And I was going through the pictures, he said, oh yeah, there's Fam, there's Ku, there's not, oh, there's me. <laughs> I hope you have that same experience yeah. here. I hope yeah. you do. You didn't bring that photo out of No, I was going to and I forgot about it. Darn. Somehow. Yeah. I told you there was something I missed. Yeah. I wanted to pray. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> got it. Well, thank you so much. Is Again, is there anything else that you'd like to talk about? While we're here, we can put it all out. Yeah, right now I can't think of anything. Else. Well, I'm here for three days. I, I'm okay. here for Sunday. So if there's anything else you want to talk about, grab me. All right. Come right back up here. All right. That'd be thing, great. If that's okay with you, okay? Yeah. And thank you very much. Oh, no, no. And these will be on YouTube, all right? Okay. So that's where I'll put it. Take one. Fast movers in the night means search and rescue at first light. Maybe her come up, boys. Now get your young ass on that horse. We took big errors on this song. Take it off.